You two have a fantastic scene together. It's not long, but it's delicious somehow. We, we almost anticipate the moment that these two characters get to actually meet. And you like him. Completely. You know, I, I like people that are what they say they are. Right. I mean, that's... Even a fool and a knave? You absolutely. ask him, which are you? Yeah. My, 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 but I end up saying, I'll, 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 do, I'll say it for you. You're both. Yeah. Stop, right. stop. You're both right. That's the, that's the amazing thing about Shakespeare, too, is that he's, he, he would, didn't have to bring these two characters together. Right. But he did, and he allowed this little bubble, or this little scene to happen between those three people that, is, that gives it life and gives it warmth, and uh, it would be much lesser play if that scene wasn't there. Right. And, the, and, the, and in a way, they're both seers of truth, or, you know, yeah. on some level, and that we both get to confront Parolles at the end is like... Yes. It's important. Yeah. I think that's the connection, actually. Yes, yes. That, that he wanted that scene to happen, so he gave us that other one. Right. And um, there's an appreciation for what he does. You know, this sense of, you know, um, saying he's shrewd. Not a word that one would particularly use when you're talking about a clown, a fool, or a knave. And unhappy, which is kind of an interesting. I mean, now we hear that as being unhappy, morose, but it could mean many other things, right? Yeah. Mischievous, it would unlucky. Unlucky as well. Without hap. Yeah, without hap. So, in a, meaning, you know, a shrewd can tell what fortune's doled out and what fortune has doled out to him ain't so good. Yeah. Yeah. So he's aware, he has, has a certain degree of self awareness. Right. Yes. Yes, his life is kicked him around enough that he's learnt, learnt about it. Yeah, but it doesn't stop him from going on. Like yeah. He hasn't crumbled under it. Yeah. Lavash shows up quite often in this production. I mean, he starts, plays off, he comes in, and, and you watch, um, watch the play almost through his eyes because Marty will have you looking at the action and then we, we follow it through. What was some of the thinking behind that? Well, I think a lot of it did come from um, that the song among nine bad that he was one that saw the goodness uh, in in that person. I mean, they, as Stephen said, they, they all do. But he was, and also that he was on the fringe enough that he was on the fringe enough that he could be uh, have that perspective of someone who's outside. Um, so I think that was a, that was a lot of it. And he's an intriguing character, you know. And uh, as I say, Shakespeare gives you enough, but not too much, so that you can you can flesh it out in all kinds of ways. You know, it's interesting, this story is so old, it comes from Boccaccio and he adapted it and changed it, but it seems to me to be so modern because it's, it's, you know, it's the generational change, these kids who on the one hand are, uh, you know, they decide what they want and they're going to go do it. And it's a very modern idea. I mean, these are not two young people, Bertram and Helena, who decide that they're going to follow what people want them to do. And some people would say, well, they know what they want. Others would say they're selfish, which is, I guess, a very good way of describing the modern age. It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. You both, in a way, because of your connection to the past, because you are you know, a, a person who is, again, the senior in social order, you have this wonderful line, after the king is healed, where you say, you know, they say miracles are past. And you talk about the scientists who now tell us they've got everything figured out. But really, we don't know all that much. And we refuse to recognize that what we don't know. There seems to be a real clash in this play between a modern determinist kind of age and then an age that still has a respect for that thing that can come and slap you in the back of the head when you least expect it. And it almost some would say feudal, superstitious, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think that's wisdom. I think that's real wisdom to be able to say, don't discount magic. Or mystery. Or mystery. Right. Or, or grace. Or, or anything yeah. that, that, of, of the power of healing. Don't discount mm -hmm. that. You know, it's one thing to have all the people, you know, all the scientists figuring it out and explaining everything away for you. But, but where's the sort of magic in life then? Yes. Well, There's especially no since the explanations turn out to be no more profound understanding of cause, but rather a description of the phenomena. Yeah, you know? but we now know that that's true, that people who um, um, you know, are inspired by things other than medication are healing themselves yes. through uh, relationships and people and other things that, with no explanation yeah. about why that happened. And they've been on every kind of drug going, and mm. then suddenly there's a, there's a, there's a healing. That, that, that happens in our time, too. Right. I mean, how did, he, how did he know about that? How did Shakespeare yeah. get onto that? Well, you know, I, I think that some people have said, well, as the, these plays matured, that he gave up on the ability of humans to solve their own problems. And um, 
and you know turns to the supernatural. On the other hand, I, you were saying before this broadcast, you said there's miracles everywhere. All the time. You know? People are finding pictures of Christ on toast probably right now somewhere. You can get it on eBay if you want. <laughs> Hurry. Um, so, I guess to a certain degree then, he might be saying in these plays, you know, the miracles are kind of right under our noses, on toast. Absolutely. Yeah, no, but I, I, I mean, I was yeah, doing it, but I, I don't, know. you know, I didn't mean to make light of it. I, I do think that that's possible and we have to leave our, our, our minds and our hearts open to that. And, and it's funny because I think, sometimes, I don't know if you experience it, or, or if you experience it, I think, in rehearsal where you think, this isn't working, this is not working, something's wrong. Suddenly you put it in front of an audience and something happens. It's that, that it's something that you don't, I don't understand. I'm always amazed, but often it happens and it's like a tiny miracle. Yeah. Suddenly the show right. I think that's lifts, off, it lifts off and it works. Yeah, it's, and it's, I don't know why. I think it's, because, this is my theory on that, is because the play doesn't happen on stage. Yeah. It happens in the air between the audience yes. and the stage. Mm -hmm. So w until you get that element, it can't happen. Yes. You can do it in a vacuum and figure out wh yes. wh how it might go. Which is but sort of the science there, of it, isn't it? Yeah. it? There ain't no play. You know, it, when you're watching the play in the rehearsal, or on stage as a director, it sometimes lacks a focus and I, you don't know what it is. But then you get 1,800 people in the room and you think right now, you know, 1,800 people are going to make it noisier. And instead, it provides stillness mm -hmm. and focus. Is there the other character? Right. Yes. They're, 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 they're the thing you're missing. Yes. Um, the audiences are loving this play, and uh, and I think discovering it. I don't think it's a play that's done all that often. Of course, we did in our first year. Is this the first time you've both done All's Well That Ends Well? Oh, yes. Yes. First time for me. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And, and I'd only seen it once before. And I've got to tell you, when I read it, I had to read it about, about 10 times yeah. before it started to make any sense yes. at all. Huh. I didn't know who was dead at the beginning, who yes. was talking to who. I knew nothing. It's I really... promise you, it's very clear in the theater. <laughs> yeah. Very clear. But I read it ten times yeah, yeah. and I figured it out. And, and actually, in that, in that first production here, in it, the clown was 50. cut. Oh. He was completely, he completely cut, cut on it. Yeah. So I'm happy he's not. Yeah, it's uh, indecipherable, so let's get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever find out why? Did you ever...? I think it was a time. I think they were, right. you wanted it you know, slightly shorter. So. And a little bit less uh, rustic, or I, I, don't I, I guess so. it was a modern dress production. Oh, what was you know, it? '53. Oh. Yeah, it was, it was a, Edwardian. Wasn't yeah, it? it was sort of. It was a bit eclectic, but you definitely got the feeling because he had. It looked a little bit like 1950s party dresses when you saw it, and it's, it was Edwardian, but it seemed to really give you a sense of now, and um, which is great in '53, right yes. from the beginning. Yeah. yeah, I see a question up there. So, what period have you set the play in? Right, and we've chose to set in the late 1880s. Um, um, because Marty felt that this play had a real affinity with the plays of Chekhov. It's a relationship-driven play. It's not big on plot. It's, it's really about the relationship that people have, and it. it's, it's very Chekhovian in that. Um, and mm. so I think she wanted to sort of line it up with, 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 with plays of that period. It's a good kind of end of uh, century play, too, and totally. kind of those times when the new age, the modern age, is taking over from the old. Absolutely. Yes. This isn't a question, really. Um, thanks, Stephen. Someone has written for hundreds of laughs. You are a wonderful clown, fool, and serious actor. Well, thank you very there much. There you go. Is that your That's agent? Very nice. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. All right. Well, so um, you're both open now. So, mm -hmm. what do you got planned for the rest of the summer? You're finally out of rehearsals. You're just doing how many shows a week? Um, five or six. Five or six. Yeah. yeah. So. What are you going to do? Where can people meet up with you when they come to Stratford? Oh, just look for a sign that says pansies and fudge. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm All quoting, right. <laughs> I'm quoting Ruth Gordon. Okay. <laughs> I can see you guys at Zares, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Listen, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Stephen, for doing this. Thank you. This is great. And, right. um, Thank you very much for joining us and especially for your questions and your comments. Next week, we are hoping, because rehearsals are underway right now for Their Rain's Love, in which uh, Simon Callow was going to be uh, yeah, working on the sonnets of Shakespeare and telling us a little bit what he's gotten out of those sonnets and what they might mean about, uh, about Shakespeare himself. We're hoping to lure him away from rehearsals and get him here on the webcast next week. And if Simon can't make it, we promise you an extremely interesting guest. What are you guys doing next week? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. We'll see you next week.